I get the time to be able to introduce Johan. So Johan is an excellent speaker from what I have heard across the board on this. And Johan, I was, ex I was asking one of his friends to kind of explain to me what Johan's personality is like. And Johan is very much like a Swede. So he's, he's from Sweden and kind of lives like a Swede. So if you get a chance, uh, go ahead and scan that uh, QR code or, and or go to the URL, the tiny URL link behind Johan Swede. And you can see the video that explains what we mean by living like a Swede. So, Johan, thank you, welcome sir. Welcome to the stage, man. Thanks. I've seen that video. It's, it's really good. Uh, welcome. Thank you for taking your time joining the session this last or late in the afternoon about the OSD. How many in here is, are actually in, in somewhat doing OS deployment? All right. So, this session is about building a reference image. In Windows 7 and Windows 8, do we technically really need to have a reference image? Yes or no? No. Correct. So uh, I guess we're done here. So 43 minutes to go. Obviously, there are benefits of creating a reference image. The title says Windows 8.1 but the stuff that I'm going to cover in this session is equally valid for Windows 7 as well. Because quite frankly, that's what most companies, even today, are still deploying, Windows 7. But from an imaging standpoint, they work exactly the same. There are some extra tricks I will mention about the Windows 8.1 image, but all in all, it's, it's there. Now, this is me. The photo is me on a good day. The green dot is where I work. The image in the middle, that's where I live, Sweden. Beautiful in the summertime. Between May and September, it's a fantastic place to be. Rest of the year, not so much. Up to the right-hand corner, there's a VM Monstra company. That's the demo environment that I'm using. And that demo environment, as Kent mentioned this morning, it's actually available for download. So if you want a replica of all the VMs and lab stuff that I have here on stage, there is a free download from my blog, which is Deployment Research as well, where you can download those VMs, or rather a kit that builds those VMs for you. Personally, I'm using Twitter as my number one source for information these days. For the past years, I usually have monitor RSS feeds or forums or whatever. Now I have Twitter as my main source for information. So please follow me on Twitter if you're interested in OSD stuff. And also check the people that I follow because I try to follow the, all the OSD geeks around the globe uh, for information as well. Or send me an email. This year, I will be celebrating my 25th year as an uh, ID Pro. I've been OS deployment all that time. It was easier back then. DOS, floppy, copy, done. <laughs> that, it means I've seen a lot. So if you have any issues or run into something, please reach out to me. I'm normally pretty good in, in responding to emails or tweets or cloud or Facebook or Gmail or Google or whatever. Most social media can find me. I have a very unique last name. It's about 10 people in the world with that last name, and so far I'm the only one doing deployment. <laughs> this is the main components to do OSD Microsoft style. And in this session, we are going to focus on the mid one, MDT 2013 Light Touch, because that's the platform I recommend to use when you create reference images, no matter where you are going to end up deploying them with. Most of us here is probably going to deploy them with Config Manager, but there are other deployment solutions out there. You may want to use VDI solutions. You may want to use Windows Deployment Services. You may want to use MDT 2013 Light Touch to actually deploy it. You may have VMware, where you want to clone a template. You may have VMM, where you want to clone a template. You want to use VDI in Server 2012 R2. You need a reference image for all those scenarios. And the only solution that I know of that works really well to build that universal image is the one in the middle. Technically, you can create ref images in Config Manager as well. Yeah, but then it's limited to Config Manager, basically, because in that process, Config Manager will put their client into it, and suddenly you have an image with a client, which doesn't make sense to have if you don't deploy it with Config Manager. So, but I'll come back to that in the middle. 
This is a slide about making your life easier, making sure that you have an automated process, a standardized way to create that reference image. There are two sure ways to make me uh, upset. The first one is to show me a 10-page document where the title says, what to do when we create a new reference image in this company, and then follows 10 pages of steps and steps and steps that you need to do every single time it's time for a new reference image. No, those should be automated, all those steps. I can live with a few manual ones, I can do that because sometimes stuff is tricky to automate, but most of them should be automated. Because if you get an error in an image, it doesn't actually get smaller because you decided to deploy that image to a thousand machines. If it's really broken, it could be actually be a, a, you call it CLM over here, a career limiting move, if you break too many machines at the same time. But if you have an automated process, your image will be equally good or equally bad every single time you generate it. The second way to make me upset is to show me a physical machine that you have on a, on a sort of a, small tower in the office and you, you worship it every morning and you pray that it's not going to break because that machine you are using when you're creating a reference image. You should be using a virtual machine. I don't care if it's Hyper-V or VMware, but pick any of those two because they work great when creating reference image. Do not use physical hardware. I'll come back to that later. The last bullet, stealing with pride, it's a metaphor. Don't steal. What I mean with that is don't reinvent the wheel. If there is ready-made stuff that works good, use it. Don't create your in-house solutions when there are free stuff available that does it already. Now, in terms of imaging, <clears throat> this is actually a, a, a screenshot from, I think, uh, my worst three days uh, in my life so far. Um, I was doing a training in New York, and I decided to bring my oldest daughter with me to New York for some shopping. She was 16 at the time. I have never been in so many stores in my entire life in three days. From 9 in the morning until 9 in the evenings, walking, walking, into stores, out of stores. This is an image from one of the clothing stores she found. But this actually goes hand in hand with imaging too. What I would like to do in a deployment project, I fight quite hard to keep a thin image. Why do I do that? Well, because a thin image allows me to be the most flexible when it comes to deploying that image. The more stuff you pour onto an image or pour into an image, the thicker it becomes, the more static it becomes, and the less flexible you can be when you deploy it. A thin image is still an image with all the updates, maybe a few runtimes, maybe .NET Framework, it will be the application platform. Because if I have a thin image, I can have different lists of applications, for example. So when I deploy the image to department B, I will feed it with the application list that belongs to department B. And the same goes for department A, I will feed it with a list of applications. So I can feed the same sequence with different lists of apps to deploy, I can have a single sequence, but because my image is thin, I can be flexible. I can have it dynamically determine, all right, I'm on this site, this country, this department, and feed it with different settings. That is something I cannot do if I have a thick image. That being said, there are many organizations who really need a thick image. Educational, for example. I mean, we are here at Houston Hilton University. It's a, basically <laughs> sort of a college area they normally have really thick images because they need to be able to deploy a classroom over lunch. If you have a thin image and you need to deploy 200 apps on top of it and you need to make it in one hour, it's not gonna happen unless it's a thicker image. So it's all depending on how, how long time you want to spend with it. But at least put updates in it. That's something I recommend. Now, I mentioned this, use VMs. Hyper-V or VMware, but use VMs, because with a VM, we can take advantage of snapshots, and we can really crank down the time it takes to develop our reference image. Because the first time you do this, you may end up doing that image like 25 times until you nail it. And by using snapshots, you can very quickly jump back and forth 
in time, reduce the, that development effort. Maybe it'll go for a few days into a single day or two days. Snapshots is really tricky to do on physical boxes. But uh, let's get going. Let's build stuff. This is a member server in my domain. It's named MDT01, and as you can see, it's running server 2012R2. I have installed MDT, which is a free download from Microsoft. I have added nothing to it yet, but the management UI is called Deployment Workbench. It's an MSE, MSE3 snap-in, so it will crash every once in a while, but most times you don't lose any data. Data store in XML files, technically that can be locked, but most times it doesn't. Now, I need to fill this share with content. So I will create a folder, it's called a deployment share. And I will give it a name, MDT Build Lab. I will share it as MDT Build Lab Dollar. If I can type correctly. Description, MDT Build Lab. Now, this is just a container. The next step that needs to be done is to actually fill this container with stuff. And at the very least, if I launch Sumit on this guy, and by the way, Sumit is the uh, applications that the folks in the sheep seats can see better. Great presenter tool. I can add in apps. I can add in operating system. I don't need drivers. In general, you don't need drivers for reference images. They will be injected at deployment time later by either config manager or whatever deployment solution you're using, but not in the reference image, with one rare exception. Do you know that exception? No, not the internet router. It's when you have a really small computer about this size that fits into a USB port. Windows to go sticks, where you can transfer a Windows 8 setup into a USB stick that big, and you can go to a machine without the hard drive, and you can boot it on that USB stick. Great to carry your game machine with you all the time if you don't have uh, gaming machines available. That machine will get new drivers over the network, for example. And to do that, it helps if you have network drivers in it. Otherwise, it's difficult to you know, download over network. So it makes sense in Windows to go stick a reference image to actually add at least some generic drivers, some generic videos and then generic net, net card drivers. But other than that, we don't need any drivers. Packages is where you can add in hotfixes that is not available through WSUS. So you can right click and you can add packages, MSU files. You can also add in language packs or other components that are available for download, like RSAT. Later, you create sequences, but we need some components, so let's start by adding Windows 8 to it. So I will create a folder. You don't need to create folders, but it sort of makes sense to keep a little bit of a structure. To create an OS, I need to right-click. I need to say import. I need to point it to a folder where I have it. And on this machine, I have copied the Windows 8 DVD to a folder. Set up. Windows 8 Enterprise, thank you. Next, folder name, here we go. So I'm now importing uh, the Windows 8.1 operating system, and it works exactly the same if I'm going to import the Windows 7 SP1 image as well. Because of uh, SSD drives, this is pretty quick. That's in something I can highly recommend. Convince your manager to get you SSD drives. It will be the best Christmas gift ever he, can, he or she can give you because it will increase the, the performance of a laptop with, say, a factor 15 or so, especially if you run a few VMs on it. So all these VMs, all these 100 or so VMs I have running locally or have available locally on this laptop, perfect when we want to simulate and test things. Anyway, I've added the OS, and you may want to give it a better name because the default name sort of is not very good. Then I need to add applications. Can you give me an example of what type of applications that would make sense 
to put into a reference image? Any idea? .NET Framework, yes. Not necessarily an application, but it could be. You normally add it to application if you have Windows 7. Flash could be, but normally that's a really small app that you can actually deploy the latest version at deployment time instead. But .NET Framework is a component for apps. That could be a requirement. But yeah, Flash could be an app. All the runtimes are normally add-in. But as you saw, when I did something in the console, every time I, I completed a wizard, in the right-hand corner here is a view script button. That will show me the PowerShell command to do in PowerShell exactly what I did in the console. So when I'm going to add apps, I have two different options. One, I could right-click here, say new application, and browse through the wizard every single time. C++, 2010, x64, and I will browse the folder where I have it. Give it a name, I will give it a command line, and I will continue to do that until I add all my applications. Or I can go into PowerShell, and I can launch a script. That will, imp whoops. That will import the applications instead. Very uh, magical script. One line for each app, where I simply specifying the same information as I did in the wizard. So I completed the wizard once, copied and pasted the line, and then I just added them together here. So now I have added in a few applications that I think make sense to have in a reference image. Silverlight and all the runtimes for C++. And I actually added in eight C++ runtimes, right? Here's a list of eight. I use wrappers that will detect if my machine is a 32 or 64-bit OS. And if it's a 64-bit OS, the wrapper will install both versions, both 32 and 64-bit. But if it's only a 32-bit OS, it will only install the 32-bit runtime. And all those scripts and all those uh, that um, command I was running is available for download on my blog if you want to see how it looks. Now, I've added some apps. I added the OS. Now I need to create a sequence. So I will right-click and create the sequence. Ah. Give it a name. And try to spell enterprise with a Somewhat correct spelling. I need to select the sequence template. This is a client, but it could also be a server. But I will select the client. I will select the OS I added before. And I don't need a product key. This is an enterprise. I use a KMS server. Some OS settings. I don't need a password. I will set that in deployment instead. And I have now created a sequence. The final piece of the puzzle is to configure settings for my deployment share. Because when you start the deployment with MDT, there is a wizard that starts when you deploy a machine. And by default, it will stop and ask you for about everything. And I don't want to be asked for <laughs> that many things. So I normally add in some text files. Because these text files will control whether to skip the first wizard or not. I can pr uh, add in credentials into my boot image. And no, it's not a security risk. This will be an ISO file that you will have on your machine only. So you can protect it with password. It's only yours, that, v, that ISO. So it doesn't really matter if the password is in clear text. Then the other inner file controls the wizard. It will control the number of panes that you will see when you start the deployment. So for example, it will not prompt me for a computer name because I configured it to, well, skip computer name. It will prompt me for a sequence because I said no to skip sequence. But anyway, I will add those answer files in. I will copy them to the control folder. 
And if you ever need to do a complete backup of all the settings in a deployment share, copy the control folder because everything is stored here. For example, in the application's XML file, these are all the apps that I added in. They are stored in here. So everything is stored in XML files. Now, to make the process a little bit faster, I will make sure I only have 64-bit um, boot images available. So I will right-click and I will do update. Normally, this will take about two and a half minutes. If it takes 15 minutes, which may happen to you, you are probably having antivirus software running on the server, and you did not exclude the DISM process from it. Then this can take 15 minutes or more, or actually break. McAfee is quite known for this, breaking the update process. But at this point, it's actually building boot images that I later can go to the VM and mount and start my deployment. Now, if I have a client here, I can obviously um, go to a clean snapshot and I could mount it on the ISO when it's created. But I can also use PowerShell to actually create VMs. I don't need to create them in Hyper-V Manager. So in the demo here, or in my scenario here, I, I, I configured the wizard to ask me for a sequence and for ask me whether I would like to capture this or not when it's done, the deployment is done. If I change this to yes and specify a sequence ID and I say yes to here and specify a file name, now that process is fully automated. Now I only need to start the VM mount it on the ISO, and it will do the full deployment. It will install the OS, it will install the applications, and it will run update, making sure the machine is updated, sysprep it, capture it, and put it on the server. So the task of creating a reference image is to start the VM and having a long coffee break. You can do this through PowerShell. Here's an example. And I can see Kent is eager to learn this. This is a PowerShell script that will build a VM, mount it on an ISO, wait until it's completed, turn it off, and delete it. So that means every time I need a reference image, I know need to fire up that script, and an hour later I have a reference image. Now, to get this to work, I have another example here as well, which is quite handy. I have a KMS server in my lab, and it turns out that server is almost every single time not enough machines running to keep it you know, up to date. So I have a PowerShell script that builds 25 VMs and activates them against my KMS. Same process, creating a VM, mounting it on an ISO. Now, back to the server, which should be completed now, or almost. I've seen this happening a few times, also antivirus. Uh, it's trying to add in HDA to the WinP image. And if it fails, when you start the deployment and it says, I cannot find uh, the wizard, or the deployment wizard cannot start, it's probably because WinP couldn't add HDA again because of antivirus software in it. All right, we'll give you that a few more seconds to uh, complete here. Any questions? So why do I use light touch? Why don't I build my reference images in Config Manager? I gave you one valid reason before. Because with light touch, I can have a reference image I can use for everything. But could there be other reasons? Any ideas? Well, first of all, it's about twice as fast as anything else. You will set it up in about 15 minutes. You will deploy it twice as fast as everything else. Second is, it's extremely easy to delegate. 
if I wanted Kent to deal with my reference images, I simply need to figure out a way to copy a folder to Kent. So I can do Robocopy, XCopy, Rich Copy, Explorer, or Normal Copy or PowerShell. That's it. The entire solution lives in that folder. In this folder here, the deployment share, the MDT build lab folder, that's it. That's the only thing I need to copy. I don't even need to give Kent access into my config manager console. The third one is there is an option or feature in Windows setup that's been available quite some time. It's called copy profile. It's not used that much in Windows 8.1 because there are other mechanisms like PowerShell that sort of replaces it, but it's still around and it may be useful and it's especially useful for Windows 7 deployments. What it means is that if you have a reference image with an administrator profile and you customize that profile, you install a few apps, you do some settings, you customize, customize it in one way or another, then when you deploy that image, you can have Config Manager copy the admin profile at deployment time to default user so that every new user of that machine will have the settings from the admin profile that you configured in the reference image. Now, if you build your reference image in Config Manager, guess what? You don't have an admin profile. You're never logged in as admin. It's being built a system, a local system. And it turns out it's really difficult at deployment type to copy something to default user that you don't have, right? So that's another one. I did mention flexible, that you can have the same image for VMM, VMware, Configman, WS, MDT, whatever. Everything that can deploy a WIM file, you can use MDT to create the image for. All right. And finally, it's a sneak preview or a sneak track to learn Config Manager deployments. MDT and Config Manager is part of the same enterprise client management organization within Microsoft. It's been that since December last year. Before that, they used to be separate teams. Now they belong to the same organization, which means hopefully we'll see more and more integration between the two. And already in Config Manager R2, they already added in a few of the steps that MDT carries around and extends Config Manager with. So MDT adds around 280 enhancements to Config Manager. And MDT is a free download. And they uh, took three of them and added them natively in Config Manager. So I figured with this rate and a new release every second year, um, it will take some time until it's sort of fully, sort of all the features are added in. So I still use MDT integrated, but they are getting there slowly, I guess. All right, now my ISO is ready. So now I just need to copy it to my host. So I will connect back to my server. MDT build lab dollar. I will Specify an account. Uh, and a super secret password. Here we go. So I will go to that deployment share. I will go to the boot folder. Because as you can see, I got an ISO file. So I will take this ISO file and copy it to my host. So I have a demo folder, SKU14. I will paste it in. I will take a VM and I will mount it on that ISO. This is just the boot image, just WinP5. And what the VM will do is will 
WinP will boot, and it will connect to my deployment share because of the settings that I had in my inner files, and it will prompt me for sequence and where to store my image because those were the only options I added in the inner file and said, all right, I, I, want, I want to ask about those questions or that part of the wizard. Now, didn't I forget something? Previously, I added in my apps, I created the, added the OS, I created my sequence. How are the apps going to be installed? My wizard was configured not to ask for applications. It said skip applications equals yes. So if I want to have my apps, I need to add them to my sequence. So I will go to my sequence, go somewhere in the end of it, create a folder, it's called group, my apps. And now I can add in apps that I earlier added in. So I can add in my Silverlight and give it a name. I can copy and paste a few times and select the other apps. So I'm simply adding the apps to the sequence, one by one like this. If I want to, I can enable Windows Update. What will happen if you do that is that MDT, at that point in the sequence, will contact Microsoft Update and start downloading updates directly from Microsoft Update. Don't do that. You have no control of those updates, and if you run this 10 times, you will see it fail at least one out of 10 because of a timeout bug in the script. A much better option for you guys and the downside of using MDT, to be quite frankly, have a separate WSUS server running on a VM somewhere that you only use for your reference image because you cannot point it to the one you're using in Config Manager, unfortunately. If it's still worth it, absolutely. Every single customer I work with, they have a separate WSUS that we use for reference images. So if I have that, I simply enable that action and I will configure my rules to say, hey, go talk to whatever WSUS server is. And if you have a custom port, you need to specify the port like that. Then it will only install the updates that you have approved on your WSUS server. If you did not approve .NET Framework, it won't install .NET Framework, for example. Anyway, so that's something you can do in the sequence. So when I start my deployment, I simply select the sequence. I select where to store the image. And I'll have coffee. Everything from here is automated. It will install Windows, it will install the apps, it will run update, it will sysprep and capture it to a WIM file that I can later import into Config Manager, for example, and deploy throughout my enterprise. Now, what if you want to do something manual? You have that strange application. You want to have AutoCAD in your reference image for the engineering department because it's a big application. And it's really complex to set up, automated, automated. How can you have the sequence abort in the middle so that you can do at least one thing manually? Well, you can add a suspend action. If you copy it a two-step somewhere and rename it to suspend, and you change the script to LTI suspend. What you will have is that the sequence will abort at this point and yes, kill itself. And that looks like this. Since we are in the universe, I can warp in time. So I can warp 10 minutes from now 
into the future. And I can start a VM at that point. Again, tricky to do with physical hardware, easy to do with the VM. So this is a VM that has come to that step where it says resume sequence. At this point, I can restart this VM 10 times. I can install that tricky application to automate. I can do my setting that was tricky to automate. Or why not just verify that you got all the updates and that the image is actually looking somewhat OK. What do you do next after you did your manual thing? How do you make the sequence continue? What is your next action? You take a snapshot of the VM, and then you hit the icon, because that will resume the sequence at that point and continue to do the rest, sys prep and capture. But by having a snapshot, you can now have versions where you very quickly can jump back and forth in between, testing different configurations. And if you remember my sequence, that was actually another Windows Update action after as well. Are you under, is that under a default profile window? Are you under, is that under a user account for this project? So the question is, on what account am I logged in as? Administrator. So that means if I want Config Manager to copy profile or copy this profile to default user, I'm already set for it. This is not something that you do in the reference image. That configuration, that Microsoft's documentation is wrong on that point. That's something you do at deployment time. But that assumes that you have an admin profile. Here is a bug, by the way. Aren't you supposed to see slightly more icons or items on the start screen? This is because I was using the Windows 8.1 GA image, the one that was released October 18. But as you probably know, Windows 8.1 RTM'd a month before. And if I use that image, I will see everything. This is a known bug. It has not been fixed yet. Plenty of customers around the globe reported it, but so far, no fix. Or is there? Well, we always have Kent. I can create a local user named Kent. And again, I can warp in time when I'm logged in as Kent. So now I'm Kent, and now I have all my items. So I simply created a local user and logged in as that local user. Now I can use PowerShell, or Kent can use PowerShell. And I can use it to, let me adjust this for a bit. I can create a folder, eventually. And I can use an export start layout command. Export start layout. Only available in the enterprise edition, not available in professional. I need to specify path. Sorry? Well. The comment was, way to go, Microsoft. Um, I don't work for Microsoft. But for me, professional is for the hardcore gamer that wants to play game at home and wants to have all the features. Enterprise is what you all should be using, because it has all the features. So basically, if you buy something else, and it doesn't have what you're asking for, tough luck. I recommend Enterprise works. And I do not have stocks in, in options in, in Microsoft. Anyway, export and the path, and I need to specify where I want the, the, uh, the, the exported uh, to be in. 
so I will give it a name, uh, via Monstra. Uh, I can either do a binary file, if I say as bin, and I get a binary file of the start screen information. So if I had done some customizations, I maybe pinned some desktop apps to it. It will be in that binary file. And then at deployment time, I can actually copy that binary file to all the machines. So all machines get a base set of the start menu, of the start screen that, that you configured for them. Another option is to export it as an XML file. And, and when you do that, you get an XML file that you can add in into a group policy in Active Directory, and you can deploy through group policy that start screen that you configured. The difference is, if you do an XML and you use group policy, they are enforced. User can't change them. If you do the bin file, they can change them. It's a preference, the bin file. So in most cases, I recommend the bin file, unless you want to upset the user because they won't be able to change stuff. But this means you can also configure stuff like, for example, I recommend to do this configuration in policies to have the start menu displaying desktop apps because if you sort by category, you can have desktop apps available. And there is a policy that you can configure that will, when someone presses the start button, it will display this list and it will display desktop apps first. Because most of you are still using desktop apps. Most of you are not having Metro applications or Windows 8 style applications. So when I hit start, they will see their normal apps they're used to work with. And I think that's better than having this as a default, unless you have many Windows 8 style applications. But this is, this is it. In a session of total, so far, 43 minutes, I have created a reference image, a system that will build it equally good every single time, and that I can use with every deployment platform known to, known to man that can deploy WIM files. Any final questions before uh, hanging off or leaving to the next presenter? which is Jason, and he only has five minutes, so he really wants me off the stage when I'm supposed to be on, off the stage. I'll be around throughout the day. On this site, deploymentartist.com, I have gathered all the OSD resources I could think of, trainings, videos, books, blogs, whatever, that are related to OSD because that's what I do, and that's what I like doing. And, uh, Thank you for taking your time and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.